Hello, everyone. So, no Kanban, the four other ways to make work visible for fun and profit. My name's Andy DeVale. I work for my own consultancy, Work Visible, but I spend most of my time as a consultant with Emerging. So, um, I have to give it to you, this title for the talk is a little bit misleading, all right? So, <laughs> so we say, uh, no Kanban. Uh, well, actually, there is a bit of Kanban in here. We say, four are the ways to make work visible. Well, actually, there are four things, although it's not really about work, as in flowing work through the system. It's more around those things that surround the work that normally are hidden as well. <coughs> Fun and profit, well, for me, I'm in this game because um, it's all about improving people's working lives. I passionately believe that the, the way that we manage really holds back creativity and gets in the way of companies being more profitable, more innovative, and more creative. I think Kanban's a great way of unlocking all that stuff. So for me, the fun is the things that I've tried out here I'm going to share with you have helped achieve that in the, in the companies I've worked with. So that's why it's fun for me. On the profit side, firstly, apologies if any of you are here for the first ever Kanban Get Rich Quick Scheme, because this is not that. And when we're talking about profit, what we're really talking about is profit for the organization that you're working with, making it become more healthy. Okay, so with that disclaimer out of the way, no Kanban, the first thing we're going to talk about is amazing Kanban, how it's actually fantastic. So, and the premise for the talk is that the things that make Kanban awesome can work in other places too. So to start us off and to kind of get on a, on a, on a level playing field, I'm going to pick on one thing in particular about Kanban that I think is brilliant and try and explore how uh, we might use it in other places. So, a tale of the... Um, unavoidable. So this is Company Z. Company Z is having a bit of a hard time just now. Things aren't going terribly well. And they're trying to think, how do we solve this? And one of them on the internet saw this thing called Kanban, Agile Lean, so they got very, very excited. That'll solve our problem. I've been looking for a silver bullet. Anyway, so generally what happens is they try a little bit themselves, but pretty soon they get someone in to help. So uh, this is supposed to be me, by the way, in this particular instance. But it could also be any of you as well, uh, except for those ones who don't have beards. Um, all right, so come in. We do our kind of yee-haw and start off the gig. And then we go to get started. So what's the first thing we do? We'll get Let's Make Work Visible. And you know, I know if you're strictly following the kind of Kanban adoption process, this maybe isn't exactly where you start. But I think it's great fun just to get everything out that's hidden in terms of the work that's going on straight away. And generally, it looks something like that. Whoa. So, you know, over here we've got coming in at speed, lots of new requests in, in our bit in the middle there, in doing. Well, you see, they haven't got much on, really. Well, they actually don't have much on because most of that is blocked, waiting, not being looked at in several years, growing mold, whatever it might be. And then over on the right here, we've got, oh, We've got something done. Is this a familiar picture to anyone in the room? Has anyone seen this type of thing before? OK. Good to see, about half and half. So what generally comes next is, whoa, people get ideas. They ask questions. It gets people thinking in a way that's simply not possible by just making a statement about, we've got too much on. People understand suddenly why they've got that feeling of a mountain on their shoulder, that sense of pressure because all of this stuff has been hidden and not been able to get through it, through it. In some places, actually, they don't think that. They just look at that and say, oh, well, that's normal, and accept it. But then over time, if you keep it visible, then soon enough, they just can't get away from the fact that um, there's something very wrong about this picture. The whole thing is unavoidable. And the idea here is that visibility generates insights and questions about how to improve if it's unavoidable. If you make things visible and they're just kind of vaguely interesting, but they don't have any impact, then people look at it, but they don't get that kind of visceral response that makes them really question what they're doing. OK, so let's recap. So you might think, recap, Andy? We've just started. How can you already be recapping? Well, we'll, we'll recap again later, so, so don't worry about that. So work is hidden. We make it visible. And actually, that's supposed to be a jack-in-the-box coming out is it's a bit, bit terrible as a drawing. And then that generates questions, insights, and ideas for change. And that's great. We're all familiar with that idea. It's a powerful idea. 
It's one of the things that makes Kanban great. It's its ability to generate these, these questions and insights. But there's a but, which is between that insight and pe between actually people making the change, taking the action to get the results that you're hoping to get, there's a big gap. It's actually a chasm. What's in that chasm? What's at the bottom of that chasm? Any ideas? Anyone find anything at the bottom of the chasm? I've generally found that it's this, the status quo. Crocodiles. In fact, on one, one gig I was in, we drew up the, the crocodile of the status quo a few months in, and it was a long gig. And the last thing I rubbed off the wall in that gig was the crocodile because he was still there in some places. So, okay, so, we, so a lot of things that we need to change aren't work if we want to get success in an organization, if we want to work, if we want work flow to better, if we want to get better results for our people, for our organization. Environment, and it's not just about buildings or whether you be, you know, a hipster sitting under a tree. It's the holistic environment you're working in, uh, the culture, of course, this is a familiar culture to all of us, taken from the, the Beano, no doubt, uh, and individuals. Just like work, many of these things are also hidden. So the question I had was, what if we try and make those things visible? What if we try and make those things unavoidable so it generates the same kind of insights that you get when you look at a wall full of your work in progress that's just been thrown up? So basically, we have this idea that plans to change behavior are a function of thoughts, the belief that change is possible by making better choices. But when it comes down to it, um, when you actually do something, it's more about how you feel than what you think. And the thing about making things visible and the way we do it very physically with, with Kanban, and Chris was talking about this this morning when he was talking about interactions, when they went from a digital board to a physical board, and the, the action of going up and seeing something and holding it and taking it off the wall suddenly generated some interactions, generated some insight. And the important part of that is somewhere in their identity, people knew something was wrong and they wanted to change it. And it's that feeling that actually drives behavior. You follow it down, rather than the intellectual understanding of an idea. So what I'm going to do is take you through some things that I've tried in trying to answer the question how to make things around people and environment visible to generate kind of insights and to uh, enable change outside of just the focus on the process and how we deliver work. Hmm. This was the first one for me. So what if we make context visible? So for me, this is, this is about, I'm going to go and start working with a team or with a new client or with a new business. And what I don't know before I arrive is what I'm arriving into. Uh, and actually, generally, it can take quite a while after you arrive to really get a sense of that. What are the key things that you're going to have to do in that environment? You don't know whether you're arriving in the Mediterranean. If I arrive in the Mediterranean, it's fantastic. Because I can walk along, I can drop my seeds of Kanban wisdom, and no matter where I drop them, you know, the sun is shining, it's a nice environment, everything just grows without you doing much about it. There's the enthusiasm, the interest, the drive in the people to get results. A whole bunch of different people could go in there with different things, and it would just take in the organization because it's ripe for it. However, if I arrive in Siberia, and I admit that's not a very good picture of Siberia, um, and I arrive in an aircraft hangar, and it's a concrete floor, and I'm throwing about my seeds of Kanban wisdom, well, not a lot is going to happen. And probably what I first need to do is get a pickaxe and dig that floor up, get some soil in there, bring in some heat lamps, and create an environment where it's possible to grow. Um, time and time again, I see organizations where um, people, companies have gone in to try and get results with Agile and Lean and other, other initiatives, and they bring along their stock way of doing things and they don't ask the question, well, what are the critical things here that are going to make a difference? So what can we do to make context visible? There's a bunch of things you could do with this. Um, the thing that I've been playing with for a couple of years now is something I call time box. Very simply, this is an idea that if, let's say I'm starting a gig in your company um, in a few weeks' time, what I'll do is I'll mail out a kit to those people, and in that kit, there'll be a poster with a bunch of questions on it, a whole lot of uh, cards um, and slips, and a box 
to put these things in. And what I, what I ask people to do is, with the opening question that before I arrive, for me to be able to help you, I need to understand what's going on in your company. Uh, without that, I can't really help you because I'm just rocking up with my stuff. Can you please tell me about your company by filling in these slips and putting them in the box before I arrive? All right. So we do that. As part of my, the way I start engagements, I'll have a one-day event with, with the same aim, called Past, Present, Future, which is just as it sounds, understanding what's gone on in the company historically, for individuals and for the company, where we are now and where we're going. And that, in that bit in the middle, in the, in the present part, what we do is we put the box on the table, we open the box, and we start handing out the slips, and people will talk about, one by one, around the table, what they and their colleagues have written down. Very simple device, very simple mechanism. What does that do? You end up having a whole bunch of authentic conversations. Very quickly, I'm suddenly in a position where in these conversations, what comes out is what's going on now in the company. What are the big things that are pushing in different directions? Often you'll have a slew of things that come up that confirm a particular idea or problem. Sometimes you have very confrontational and difficult conversations, and if you're doing this, you need to be ready to facilitate those because things put pretty blunt, people put pretty blunt things in there. All the times I've done this, bar one, people have not wanted to stop the exercise because not only does it reflect to me what the context is, it makes it very, very visible to the people in the room as well, just by the simple device of together sharing and having an honest discussion about what's really going on. So that's number one. Context was hidden. We did something to try and make it unavoidable. Was it fun? Well, for me it was fun, kind of because it's a bit sneaky. People don't really know that it's coming. They don't expect that in the middle of this day they're actually going to, all the things that they wrote down that they thought were great, bad, and indifferent about the company are actually going to be talked about in detail. And from a profit point of view, invariably it's made a difference to that company and how they relate. And one of the unexpected things about how it makes a difference is in creating a sense of cohesion between the people I'm talking about, even if there's big issues, <coughs> or in fact, it creates a sense of energy and momentum. There's an element of, we're going to do something about this because we're actually having an honest conversation. In a couple of places, there haven't been, hasn't been a lot of interaction, there hasn't been a lot of conversation, and that's told me something as well, which is about that company's ability to communicate. Okay, so that was one. Two, what about if we make people visible? Right, okay, Andy, you've really lost it now. People are visible. There's at least 15 people in this room, right? We're not talking about a room full of invisible men. But to me, when I arrive with a new team, a new set of people I'm working with, they generally kind of look like this. I don't mean that they're skinny and they're grey from head to toe, but I don't know a lot about them. It's not a rich picture. This would be kind of more of a rich picture, where I've got a sense of what their strengths are as people, uh, what their experience is and how they interact with other folks, um, what their contribution has been. And for me, those things are really important because that allows me to know who are the key people I need to work with to really get things going. Are the people that are the keystones th to get results in this organization? And this can be in a team or it can be in a much wider organization. So, okay, how do we do something with that? What could we do to make people visible? Well, I kind of run through a standard three-step uh, process as part of a, a kickoff type session um, and it can be varied for your the thing I'm going to share with you is something that's suitable for people who are quite happy with kind of uh, innovation games type things but you can also dress this up for um, more executive type teams so trading cards which is an idea of doing something to expose people's strengths how they how they what they bring to the organization timeline in terms of getting a view of their experience what they've been going through for the past six months Again, you're enforcing the context. And thanks, which is about understanding contribution and how people are appreciated. So having a look at these, so trading cards first. Here's a couple of examples. What's interesting about this is you get all sorts of things coming out. So this chap on the left here, we, we can see he's a super fixer. He's a mediator. He's a solution finder. But he bores easily, gets irritated with nonsense, and doesn't complete finish. I'm never going to find that information out without going through some kind of exercise. It's never going to be visible to me until I've been there for a while, until I pick it up. So from a pace point of view, from me arriving, it's useful. You can see the other one there. 
But the benefits are really not just for me, absolutely at all, because what happens in this is people, I get people to pair up the entire group and basically write a trading card for their pair and then present back. So, you know, if I was working with Dave, I would be presenting back Dave to you guys, what his strengths were, what his Achilles heel was. For the people in the room, they're getting reinforced what their strengths are from someone else's point of view. And again, what I've found is that creates a sense of energy in people, a sense of moment momentum and a desire to do something. Timeline is really about trying to um, expose what people have gone through emotionally in the last period of time and also what they've been doing. So we start by sketching out, it's a standard template, sketching out the main events in the last six months and the period. Then looking at getting people to think about and connect with what they've actually been doing. What's the work they've been doing over that time? And just taking the time out to sit and reflect on that um, can be insightful for people. And then after that, really, what, what are the things that they've been thinking about, the main themes, whether it could be a challenge with work, it could be something personal, it could be something not related to, to work at all. Once that's done, we'll ask people to connect with that. Then we go back up here and we ask them to draw using you know, things that are higher up or indicating positive experience, things that are low down negative experience over time, to try and draw a picture of what they've been going through. Lastly then, thinking about who's helped them along the way, who have they been working with. So the idea about that is to again make visible, to me, you can imagine an entire room full of this with, with a large group. I can get a very rapid sense of what people are going through. You go in some organizations and it's, it's all up here in those touch points. Others where you can see there would be major events that have been difficult for the team. That's again something very, very difficult for me to find out about on first arrival. Lastly then, after that, you follow on, this is all in one session, you follow on with thanks, with where those um, areas where people have been helped out with others, you've asked them to connect with that. You then just ask them to write kind of a message per post-it on, um, as a thank you to, to that person. And in the last session, what they do is they've got their trading card, they'll put up, uh, they go and post up their uh, timeline above their picture, and then they take the post-its that they've got and they go and put them up underneath the people who, to say thank you to them. So you end up, as an individual, I can go up and I can see, this is me here, and I get all these notes about, from other people saying thanks for the work that I've done. What I find is that that's a great experience for the people I work with, because they get real feedback in terms of how other people appreciate their work, they get a sense of their strengths, and also brings to light how they're feeling about their work. For me, I can stand back and look at that, and invariably what happens is there will be a number of people who are obvi it's obvious that they're really contributing hugely because you can see the volume of gratitude there. Others not so much. And that, that might not be that they're not contributing, but it just might be that they're a quiet, quieter person. But it gives me a sense of context and it helps me start to get ideas about how we might help them. How we might help them get great results. So from a people point of view, it's been hidden. We've tried to make it unavoidable. Through, through running these kind of sessions and arriving. Has it been fun? Well, both for myself and the people who've participated in these things, people generally get a lot about it. And I, as I say, the, the secondary effect is that it creates a tremendous sense of energy and getting work, getting work done. Uh, and invariably, I find it's actually set, set me up very well and set them up very well for trying something new and doing something different. Okay, so they're very much on the softer side and how we arrive and uh, about the people. I think that's something that's in all the literature about Kanban, Aline and Agile, uh, we focus, tend to focus a lot on the process um, and um, in terms of unlocking results. My experience is people can get the process quite quickly. Getting through the people and some of the other challenges is far more difficult. So what if we can make conflict visible? What would that look like? Well, what do we mean by conflict? So, uh, here's a map of kind of typical organization chart uh, that I expect to see. So up here we've got, got the blue team here who are they're all kind of going that way and think the answer is over there. And then we've got the, uh, the green team over here and well, they're just kind of all over the map. They're kind of, I think it's all over the place. This chap up here who very kindly is uh, throwing a bomb on the green team because they're, they're not focused enough apparently. And we've got our chap down here running amok through the whole lot of it. So I don't know if that's 
resonates with anyone. I mean, is that a, a picture that anyone's seen anywhere in their kind of organisations? Uh, this could act as the organisational chart of probably the majority of places I go. Um, okay, so well, why is it like that? Um, well, this seems very unkind, but I think it's, uh, it's a long ways towards the truth. So, in, in my view, and there's, there's a bunch of research to back this up, the way that we behave, the way that we interpret our environment, the way that we decide what to do is based on how we see the world, quite simply. And particularly amongst different layers in the organisation, particularly across different functions in the organisation, very typically you have people seeing things in very different ways. And with the best of intentions, they come up with a whole raft of different ways of solving these problems. They talk in different languages and they try and get to different places. And what that means, but generally all of that's hidden. So back, back in this picture, this is all going on in the background. No one talks about this, that's just the, that's the wallpaper, that's the environment that people live in and, and work in. And no one ever tries to deal with it, they just try and make something happen in amongst all the noise. Okay, so what's at the root of that conflict is how they see things, and it's hidden. So the, I, the question is, how do we make it visible? And this is a very simple device. So in this kind of scenario, the, the thing that I've been playing with anyway is just the idea of a mirror. So the challenge is you need to look at the situation that you're in and figure out what are the questions that are going to make visible to these people in an unavoidable way what the situation is so they get that visceral reaction and they have to do something about it. They have to address it in some way. So you can see I've come up with questions that I've asked this bold chap here and he's come up with um, his view of the world, how he sees things. Um, and this is no doubt a familiar picture. Ask the same set of questions to another group, they've got another view. Ask the same set of questions to another group and they've got another view. Now, I'm sure we've all seen this kind of picture before where everyone's thinking of different things in their head and trying to communicate and it doesn't work. The difference here is that we're using a very deliberate structured set of questions to get that out in the open. The pictures I've seen of this before show it all in people's heads, in thought bubbles. We're taking it from that and trying to make it in a, visible in a way that's unavoidable. So what happens? You've gone around with your structured questions, you've got the answers back, you've got these people together, suddenly they see that actually, you know, I thought, you see, you see a very clear difference between what um, I would expect of my team and what my team expects of me in terms of answers to a question. Well. Culture kicks in, obviously, um, but with a bit of encouragement, and maybe if we, we need a bit of uh, problem re problem conflict resolution, we can get to a common view, at least on something, and take that something forward. So, a couple of examples. Uh, recently, team leader, four, four separate teams managing about uh, 40 people, um, just incredibly destructive, holding all the work back, invisible, uh, getting in the way, um, Team's very, very frustrated and um, not get, able to get the work done. And uh, this person was well disposed to change. They wanted to change. They had all the ideas in the head, but their behavior just completely contradicted that. They did nothing that was in line with any of the values or principles. So I had to think about, well, what are the questions here? And it boiled down to a simple set of questions. So these questions I asked that individual, I also asked all of the teams, the same set of questions. So what's that person's job? What, what are they here to do? In the last month, what's that person done? And how does that person help the teams? Now, a couple of things happened in doing this. One is very early, I and it's, it's not necessarily, so depending on the environment, you can, you can be very blunt about this, where you're making all of these things immediately very visible. That's a very challenging situation. Or you can be a bit softer. Bringing back the answers from the teams to this manager, and this manager was completely shocked because they just had a completely different view of why, why they were there. So that manager saw themselves as defending the teams from all the noise from above, and that's where all of his time was engaged. Yeah? The teams were reliant on the manager. They were expecting the manager to caretake for them. The manager was quite happy for them just to get on with it, but the teams didn't understand that. And it was only when we brought this, and this had been going on for months and months and months, and through the process of having a dialogue around these questions, they came to a different understanding of how they needed to work together and actually changed how they were working. <coughs> and the manager essentially got out of the way and made, was very explicit about 
their role in, respond, in, in looking after the teams. Top three priorities. And just as an illustration, it doesn't need to be a, a difficult conflict. It begins, can be something simple and underlying. Most organizations I go into don't really know why they're doing um, something. They're also often not clear at all on what, the, what they need to be working towards. And this lack of clarity is a huge challenge in terms of getting anything useful done. So um, I asked a team of about 15 folks, can you please each individually write down the top three priorities for this team for the next year? Uh, this is all the individual separate answers that we had, or at least some of them. So immediately, again, that's unavoidable. It's very clear that you guys are just not in the loop at all. You're not vaguely going in the same direction. And as a result of that, they worked together to get something far clearer in terms of why they're going about things. So the conflict was hidden. We did some stuff to try and make it visible. And in my, my two tests, it helped the individuals and it helped the organization get a better result. All right. What if we could get sludge visible? Now, you're probably thinking, Andy, I don't even want to know what sludge is. And if I did, I would certainly not want to make it visible. So um, sludge to me is this sense of no matter how hard you try, somehow it's just a huge effort to try and get anything done. Uh, usually, we're just living in a world of no. And so the question here is, how do we get from that to find a world of yes, where we can actually get some traction, where every turn it's not blocked? I've got a process that I've run through a few times in this kind of situation to try and get a group of diverse people, often from spread wide across the organization, to get to agree on a set of things so that we can unlock some action. So I'll just quickly talk you through that. So the first, side, the first thing to do is to go around and talk to all of the folks involved and try and get a sense of what are the underlying things, what are the hidden things that these people could actually agree on. Often this is really just looking to state the obvious. Quite often people will ignore the obvious and then start arguing about detail of things that they haven't agreed about, which doesn't make any sense. So naturally they often just can't come to a conclusion. Once you've done that and dependent on the situation, that could be a couple of days, it could be a couple of weeks, I'm usually able to articulate some items of yes, provocative, actionable statements. What does that mean? Well, simply it means some things that you might actually do instead of talk about. Yeah? So once we've got that, we can have a session. Now, the, the, the session I'm going to talk about can run from two to four hours to go through. Um, so you've got this list of things, and the first thing to do is to get the collected group, who often don't spend any time talking. And in fact, there's an argument to say that just getting these people together in a room to talk about these things is enough to make this work without having much of a structured process around it. And see if they can agree what this thing is. And um, that will generate a degree of debate. Then for each of these things, we use something called gradients of agreement. Has anyone come across that? OK, so gradients of agreement is a technique that you can use by a guy called Sam Kaner. Um, and what it does is it allows you to make visible the various opinion in a room. Have you ever been in a meeting where you say, does everyone agree? And like one person says, yeah, and a couple of people nod, and everyone's silent. In that situation, you've really got no idea of what the state of agreement in that room is. So what this asks people to do is if, if you're absolutely on board with this statement, you would hold up a one. It's kind of like planning poking, poker, but, uh, but on opinion. Whereas if you're absolutely opposed and you want to veto it, you would hold up a six. And you end up with a graph of agreement around the particular subject. OK, so this one we can see clearly, everyone's on board with that. They're good to go with that. This one is clearly a bit of a muddy topic. And this one, everyone, like no one wants to do that. But it makes visible in a very unavoidable way how they, what they think about these various actionable things you're talking about. What that allows you to do is then to talk about, well, the things that are, everyone's on board with, how useful are they? Bring to life how useful are they? Bring to life what would be involved to make it happen. And that allows you to get something that you can say yes to. Usually a smaller thing that's high value that you, you can, you can uh, use. So this is an example of a, one such session. So these are my um, actionable statements. As we went through talking about them, we bring to life, put some notes up with post-its. This is our gradients of agreement. We've got value and size. If we have a look at 
a couple of the gradients of agreement. You can see these graphs here. So this one, very clearly, they're going to run after. This one here is a bit less certain. This one actually went to progress. In fact, with this, with this group, what was remarkable was it was a very senior group of directors in a large organization. Um, they agreed on 90% of the things that needed to be done. But even as one step down from the executive team, no one believed that they had the authority and that basically the uh, completely schizophrenic executive team would just throw it out. So that made visible another problem. But we did get at least one thing we could run at. So we've taken sludge. It was hidden. We've done something to try and make it unavoidable so that people have a visceral gut reaction so they have to face it, which allows you to um, do something about it to benefit the organization. OK. So let's recap. Actually, now it's, I've done that already, so, so let's not recap. Uh, let's put it another way. If you run into challenges, beware of your eureka. So we look at a situation, we get in our head an idea, oh, we need to do this. And then what loads of people do is then they run around trying to persuade people that this is the way to go. And in a, in a complex organization, that's really tiring. Yeah? It's not to say that persuasion is bad, but it's to say that that eureka is in your head. Trying to convince and persuade people without giving people an experience is extremely difficult to do. So I'd encourage you to stop trying to persuade first and hunt out the hidden. What is it in the environment that's stopping this work? What's the hidden thing that's getting in the way? And what you'll invariably find is in a team, in a department, in an organization, there's a range of unspoken and hidden conflicts that are getting in, in the way. Some of these are massive. So there was a, a long-term client of ours. And I was in there. They had uh, a whole people change going on that was a, a massive program. They had um, all the architects were building a, a new model of how they architected solutions for the system. And at the same time, they're changing how they ran their operations. All of these things use completely different terminology. They categorize things in completely different ways. And yet, there was lots and lots of crossover. So unsurprisingly, everyone was at cross purposes. The net result of that was huge inefficiencies in the organization, was huge capacity for things slowing down and stopping because no one could agree on what happened next. So the opportunity, the, the challenge there would be how to make that visible in a way that made these people realize, this is just crazy. It doesn't make sense. We've got four architectural things. We've got three process things. And we've got, well, HR wasn't categorizing anything at all. They just had a hierarchy for everything. Right? Clearly, it wasn't going to work. Environment, culture, and people. What are the things that you want to uncover? What are the highest impact ones? What might you do to actually bring that to life? Get creative about interventions that you might run to get people to get a visceral reaction to it so they can actually go and do something. How can you make it visible and unavoidable? That way, it's their eureka, not yours. That's it. And with a few minutes to spare. <laughs> Any questions? One. Yeah, that box you sent at the beginning. So yes. You company and you get them to ask those questions. Are they anonymously asked? Yes. Well, the message I give is they can choose, right? Okay. They can choose. I can imagine it draws quite a few. Uh... <laughs> That's precisely the point. I know. Is we're encouraging people to be honest. We're also not telling them that in two weeks' time this box is going to be opened and it's kind of, you know, we're going to get all the fun of the day coming out. Um, what people share, what people talk about, what people don't talk about um, are all, all huge indicators of the environment that you're coming into. You've got something that's open, honest. People can have a direct debate about challenging problems. People just can't talk about it. Well, there's 15 things that are coming out in the same area. Any other questions? Well, thanks very much, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it.